Hello and welcome to The Appetite, a podcast brought to you by Opal Food and Body Wisdom, an eating disorder treatment center in Seattle. This podcast is all about developing a greater appetite for life in the realms of food, body, movement, and mental health. I'm your host, Carter Umhow, a therapist, writer, and artist, and I'm joined by Opal's co-founders. Dr. Lexi Giblin. Kara Bazzi. Today's episode is all about identity. Oftentimes a hyper-focus on food or body, especially at the point in which these struggles can lean more toward disorder or obsession, can point toward a crisis of identity for a person. So in this conversation today, we're talking about the ways in which identity can form and how one's relationship with food or sport can easily become a stand-in for the parts of identity that have either been lost or never developed to begin with. We'll be reflecting on what we know about identity development, what this has looked like in our own lives, and how issues of identity can specifically play out for athletes. So how do you two understand identity as a concept? Well, you know, the first thing that comes to mind with identity is just the question, who am I? Mm-hmm. How do how does one identify themselves? And the, the simple I am dot, dot, dot. What do we claim about ourselves? Mm-hmm. And uh, how do we see ourselves? What's our self-perception? Perce- and then there's also the perception others have of us. Mm-hmm. But we'll get into that more later. <laughs> <laughs> And I think about it as who we are versus what we do, Mm -hmm. because I think a lot of people would assign identity to I'm a mom or Mm -hmm. I'm an athlete. But is that who is that different than who we are? That's what we're what we do and what we're interested in and have passionate Mm -hmm. about. But Mm -hmm. is that truly that would be probably fit into the role identity? Okay, the role role identity. What does that mean? Bucket. How just there's different aspects of our identity, including role identity. So mm-hmm. I am a mom, I am a sister, I am a coach. Um, and then there's the more intra intra characteristics of personality and character that can make up identity. So there's different categories, there's different ways we can see ourselves. Mm-hmm. And, and that's actually really interesting because if we have our identity really wrapped into say roles, that's going to have a different impact on us than if we see our identity more largely made up of personality characteristics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it it does make me think of children and the development that we go through and how we start off with more concrete ways of seeing ourselves of descriptors. I am blonde. I am, I am fast. I am white. And then as we mature and, and go through development, some of those characteristics can be, uh, more nuanced and more developed as we mature and develop. And and certainly the social comparison piece comes to play of being able to, to understand who we are in relation to other people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Well, and that's, I think, Karen, you and I have talked about that. And that's been an area of my own learning and growth in recent years is realizing how much of my identity is based around my experience of relationships. Mm-hmm. So Almost like if if I'm sharing, if I'm experiencing something in the world, then I, I can't understand who I am separate from the peop- the players involved in that aspect right. of my world. So mm-hmm. how how they experience what I'm doing, how they're doing, mm-hmm. you know, what they think of of me within this. Are they gonna? How are they gonna feel about this? How am I gonna feel about how they feel? And just all these layers of relational concern. And so part of my my work and over that will probably be my life's work is just understanding who am I separate from all of that, mm-hmm. you know, which is doesn't come to me as easily as the relational identity and where I am in relation to others, mm-hmm. who I am as a human being, right? Relating, right? Some of the some of the language that some identity kind of research um, has is around kind of interdependency versus dependency mm-hmm. with I, with identity and, and the thought being like what would be healthy, kind of healthy identity that leads to higher self-esteem versus unhealthy identity. And kind of what that just made me think of what you said about the, um, if the, if the identity is dependent on the external, mm-hmm. then 
that can be that can lead to that could lead to more unhealthy identity or potentially lower self esteem depending on what kind of feedback you're getting. Mm-hmm. And and yet the interdependent also speaks to that we are relational beings and feedback does matter and our relationships do matter, but then also our own intrapersonal sense of ourself yeah. that can be also a part of who we you know who we know ourselves to be that that actually can matter too so that we're not just being floated and flipped from what other people in our lives the feedback mm-hmm. they're giving us yeah it's almost like um to to not have their facial expression in front of me mm-hmm. so it's through writing or closing my eyes that i can then tap into what my unique experience is totally. versus how are they what are they how are they relating and orienting to me yeah it's very dif- difficult mm-hmm. for me yeah it's as you guys are talking about this, I'm thinking about how complicated this question is. Yeah. I was thinking, oh, this is such a sort of basic <laughs> introductory yeah. question to this conversation. But the definition of it, I think, really could depend on people's particular struggles and yeah. particular values as yeah. well. I'm also thinking about different societies being more individualistic versus more collectivist and how there's going to be an emphasis on how someone is <laughs> in their society and what the emphasis is, right. whether that's going to be on you developing your core inner self or you developing your relationships and your role within the community mm-hmm. and what that means. feels like we're talking about a fusion of these things. Mm-hmm. Right. Like what, what is, where are we here? Where are we getting kind of the, the feedback to that, that we're getting positive yeah, reinforcement of the characteristics of who we are. And that could look different depending on different cultures. Yeah. 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 And then you think about family systems. I was just thinking yeah. about people that maybe it's all of us, but really identify something of ourselves based off of who we were in our families or mm-hmm. who we weren't in our mm-hmm. families too. Mm-hmm. So not just the positive feedback, but, oh, everyone's like this and I'm like this. Mm-hmm. Or I belong because of this reason, whereas everyone else belongs because of this reason, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Right. So it, for, for you, Lexi, you're saying that it's hard to figure out outside of those relationships kind of a core core way of being is that kind of how you would put it yeah like I'm just I just think I'm like all about community and relationships that's my a strong part of my relation and my identity Mm -hmm. and what I uh, value in the world but it's overdeveloped Mm. Mm. and so I think I've I just I to develop other sides of me um, Mm. has been important Mm. in my recent um, Mm. years Mm -hmm. Mm. I relate to that. I, I I mean, I know we've talked about that yeah. too. And I relate to that a lot too, especially just being aware of the of kind of being attuned to the other person and 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 easily and kind of unconsciously being able to respond to what people desire. Mm-hmm. And so to to have to be able to pause and actually ask myself my own questions of well, what do I want and what do I like and what feels good to me and who am I about? That there needs, I know for me, I had like that has to be very intentional or else it's Mm -hmm. very much in response to other people. Mm -hmm. And I can do that well, but then that's kind of, then there's um, less of a self, a less of a self to, to, to know who I am if it's more in response to other people. Can either of you think of like different moments in your life that felt like sort of a a crux in which you Mm. moved more into identity? Mm-hmm. development or even one in which you maybe can look back and say like oh yeah I was really struggling at that time with understanding who I was mm-hmm. yeah I I that was a, a major <laughs> major part of my eating disorder in my history was um I would say identity work was kind of the crux of it and real self-esteem and real self-worth because as an achieving kid like Lexi was talking about before a lot of my worth came from what I was doing. It was not from my being. And that isn't necessarily because I wasn't being loved for my being, but I just took in all the feedback of my achievements and, mm-hmm. and really took that as my, my worth is completely because of how I'm succeeding, how my outcomes are in school and in sports to the point of when I would perform poorly or like have a bad race, for example, I would just be in a ball of tears, Mm -hmm. like crushed because now I no longer, I felt like crap about myself. Um, So it would be going from mountaintop to crap, mountaintop to crap, like depending on my performance, like my literal outcome. 
And that's because I would have said my eggs were all in the basket of being a performer. It was what was making me okay. So that's how I identified. So taking identity and then that's where my crushing, my self-worth was so, um, so fragile and unstable. And so, you know, going into deciding, developing an eating disorder and then getting, kind of having a a recognition that I was going to be um, in, in that process, kind of deciding to go into more, more self-exploration almost felt like I was blank. Like it mm-hmm. was like the rug had been pulled out from underneath me and I didn't know who, like where I could stand on my own two feet. And, you know, most people in my life would have no idea. They would have said, well, Kara, you're this and this and this and this and all these other characteristics that were outside of my achievement. But to me, that's where I, I claim the only, those, those were those identities that I claimed so fully that to have that stripped, I was a mess. And honestly, I think a lot of athletes share that experience of really identifying in their, in their sport. And um, even if other people see them as more of a full person, they don't see themselves that way. And so with injury or retirement or something happening, it is often a crisis of identity. And that's where a lot of times people get depressed and get anxious. And, and I was certainly in that, in that category and felt like I was building off of nothing. And I didn't even, I remember thinking, I don't even know anything I like. I, I, I mean, now I have so many opinions, <laughs> but back then Surprising I was like, Kara. I know, right? Like I had no opinion. I literally was like, I don't know what I, I don't know yeah. what I like to do. I don't know what movies I like. I don't know. I, I really felt like just kind of a blank person. And that is terrifying Yeah, to go through that, that experience. Yeah. And I had a, um, I had a, what I see is a really clear fork in the road. Um, when I was a freshman in college, when I left, I was a small in, from a small town in Kansas and went to the big city of Lawrence, Kansas, which is not <laughs> that big, but at the time, wow, it was like bright lights, big city to oh. me. And when I when I moved there, I left a lot behind, and I, I left my athlete identity, which mm-hmm. was really strong through my all my years, and decided not to to pursue sports in college. I left a boyfriend back home. I left my mom back home, which was really hard for me. I left the comforts of everything I've known mm-hmm. known my whole life. There was a lot of loss that happened all at once. And I got to the University of Kansas and found myself in a, a crisis of I, I maybe identity mm-hmm. crisis, but how it manifested was just intense anxiety. Mm-hmm. Like just out of my mind with anxiety, and I th- and at that time in my life, I've just been talking with Julie Kerr recently. I think I went through a, about a year of avoidant and restrictive intake food intake disorder, where I was just so nauseous and anxious that I I'd lost my appetite and um, struggled to get enough food in every day. Though I wasn't concerned. I was not concerned about, I wasn't trying to lose weight. Yeah, it was more about, body a, image. Mm-hmm. yeah, it wasn't about body image. It was just this really intense um, threat system that was on for me that year. And I would drive home every weekend to see my, oh. to see my family, you know, mm-hmm. just rush home right after my class and get home and just be soothed for that next, for that weekend and then head back up. And it was just really, um, really painful year. And there was, there was, a lot of conversation during that year um, around whether I would move back home and, and, or stay in, at, at KU. And that was, I wanted so badly to go back home and just yeah. be soothed because the anxiety mm-hmm. was like looking down, you know, a year, endless anxiety and going home was so comforting. So I, I wanted to just go home and go to Southwestern College in mm-hmm. Winfield, Kansas. And I, and I really think that if I would have chosen to do that, I certainly wouldn't be in this in this studio with the mm-hmm. two of you right now. And my, I think I would have left, I would have been scared the rest of my life to leave Winfield. Yeah. Honestly, like I, yeah, I just think that I don't know, it would be a failure to launch situation yeah. where I would be scared and, and at home, but I stuck it out. Um, you know, cause I can remember voices, strong voices in my life saying, you know, you've got a fork in the road. You, you go you mm-hmm. hang in there or, or you can go back certainly, but, there's a big, there's, this is, these are two very distinct options. Yeah. And so I hung in there 
that year. And by the sophomore year, I started to be able to tolerate being there more. But it was mm. it was a time where I just look back and think, wow, my life could be so different mm. if I would have followed what the anxiety was telling me to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which I also think is one of the reasons I'm such a big facing fears person. <laughs> you know, there's, a, totally. there's it's part of my story. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if this feels true to that situation, but I think of like where that maybe hits an identity. I think of sort of how how we spend our time and what how we're showing up in our life and our day to day can often inform our identity. Um, so the changes that your day to day brought from going from home into to the college setting, mm-hmm. I don't know where that landed with uh, like then what you how you saw yourself. Um, but I, I would wonder about how. Yeah, how I think really a lot at that at the time that my identity was in Winfield, Can- I was a big fish, small pond. And then yeah. I went to Lawrence and, you know, it was like, who am I? I don't yeah. know who I am yeah. in relation to this new, city. Uh, this new city and all of this, this new context. And I had, I ran, I got involved with some peers that maybe they weren't as kind as mm-hmm. would have been much needed at the time. So it just, it was just a tough yeah, yeah, I totally re- learned who I had to learn who I was outside of the, the comforts of, comforts of yeah. that really that known familiar. setting. Yeah. Yeah. So transitions can lead to that. Yeah. I think that's a yeah a, a place where we're vulnerable in this way is transitions. Uh, loss, yeah. And not feeling competent too, I think. In, tra- in transitions that can, that can come up too of not feeling competent. And I think one of the questions that often comes up and identity we, we, that we talk about in rethinking exercise and sport is can we claim something if we're not good at it? And I think, I don't know if this mm-hmm. is true more for people that struggle with eating disorders, but there's this idea of I can't say I am anything unless I have a particular outcome. And I, you know, every time that kind of gets brought up, my question is, well, why? You know, if we're linking outcome to being able to claim something in identity, how sad, like it's really mm-hmm. quite sad because then there'd be so many things that we can't kind of claim about ourselves. It would be so, it's so much more narrow. And what yeah. about pleasure and enjoyment and spending time doing something? It's, it's very, it's more of a perfectionistic yeah. model for claiming identity. Totally. Mm-hmm. That makes me think of um, writing poetry with the clients at Opal. I've been leading them for years now and writing where I'm from poems, which basically asks them to think about the specifics of their past in whatever kind of way that they want to, whether that be like their hometown or their family or their eating disorder or whatever category they want to think about it in. And oftentimes the clients are like, "Ah, I don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. Kind of that blankness Mm -hmm. that you were talking Mm -hmm. about, Kara. Or some clients say, I don't like where I'm from. I don't Mm -hmm. want to actually write about this. But when the clients are feeling blank, I like to emphasize, you might think that the details of your life are so boring, but once you start saying them out loud, no one else has heard those before. Like the specifics of your street name Mm -hmm. mixed with the specifics of the the foods that were on your table growing up, mixed with that saying that your dad always said, that's going to sound really specific and very much you to someone else. And to me, that's sort of an exercise Mm -hmm. of of developing identity, um, that it's a mix of some of that external stuff, but it's also really claiming Mm -hmm. like, oh, there's some particularity here that really matters. Mm -hmm. And... I'm interacting with those particulars in a specific way. It sounds like it takes away some of the intimidating factor, just mm-hmm. like saying be it besides like, what are you good at or what do you excel at? And that's yeah. your identity. What do you enjoy? Right. What do you spend your time doing? What are like, it brings down some of the barriers of that yeah. mm-hmm. kind of that intimidating nature of it. Yeah. In my kind of like identity crisis moment, I was about 19 and dropped out of college and just knew I don't want to be doing this. I'm not really doing my schoolwork. I need to just kind of step into the empty space and figure out what's next. And Mm -hmm. my mom suggested something that I think totally changed my life. She said, why don't you just make a list for now of some things that you want to do when you get home? Mm -hmm. And I was really depressed, really depressed. I was like, I don't want to do anything, nothing, nothing at all. Um, But I forced myself to make this list. And it was some, like tiny things like yeah. eat corn on the cob, <laughs> lie in the basement when it's hot outside. You know, it was just like really basic. And then there were a couple of things that were a little bit bigger, like, oh, I think actually like going and painting and 
Greece would be cool. <laughs> you know, was like, and then I went back later and, mm. and looked at that list and that was like the beginning of, well, for some reason I want that. Not everybody yeah. wants that. Mm. So yeah. what does that say about my particular identity? Totally. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I had to, yeah, I had to look at what I might like. I couldn't even think of anything I, I liked. Did like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I just had to be like, I'm going to show up to this movie. <laughs> See what happens. <laughs> See what happens. Yeah. <laughs> Do I like that type of movie? I don't know. Was there a practice that you had or, or I think, any memories? I don't really remember any it? practice, but just, I think just the, I, I was good at doing. So mm-hmm. it helped my, my doing uh, <laughs> nature. That was helpful because then it was my harder part was checking in with myself. Yeah. So if I can just ex, ex, uh, expose myself to a bunch of different things, then I could start to formulate, oh, mm, interesting. I think I kind of might mm. like that. And mm. novel experiences novel and experiences. then seeing how, yep. what it felt like. Totally. Mm. The other thing that comes up, I think, often in, in our groups is um, thinking about internal versus external identity or public yeah. versus private. And I think that can be another area where there's a lot of um, sadness and grief and tension when they're, you know, you're perceived by the outside world in a particular way. And there's all this stuff going on internally that others don't know about. And so we do the exercise. And a lot of this is just for increased self-awareness of having people be able to write down um, how, what they think the public would say about them or people in their lives would say about them and then how they truly, you know, who they are internally and where is the discrepancy mm. and why is there a discrepancy and what does that mean for them to have that to have that awareness and does that mean that their work is to be more open and expressive of their internal world? And the other, I, I, we have a few f- fun ways of categorizing it. So another one would be like past, present, and future identity. And that's looking too at what oftentimes there's really important things in someone's past that they kind of lose sight of. And so seeing maybe what they're, we use identity pie charts, (laughs) but to see what maybe was in their past that they claimed and, and what is, is no longer or what is added and then what might they want in the future. And then we've also done a desired versus actual, what Actually, do they claim as their identity and what do they want and why is mm. there gaps there and start to to start to understand better why is question. why is there that discrepancy? And then I, always, I like the being versus doing one. What's what's going on with how they see themselves? Is it a lot of roles? Is it a lot of doing? And if and what is it? What would it be like to claim some things that are more stable and characterological? Because the more that we have in our identity pie chart, the more stable we are, because if something gets pulled we got a lot more things to kind of hold us up. Yes, mm-hmm. it's not all in one basket. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So those are fun exercises. Like it's it's yeah. it's good for just being aware. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um many years ago I had someone say to me there's there is so much you don't yet understand about yourself. Oh, mm-hmm. so ominous. <laughs> <laughs> and when I I heard it, it wasn't ominous. Okay. I didn't experience it as ominous. I experienced it as like, really? That how exciting. Mm-hmm. Like what what is this that you're seeing that I don't yet see? Cool. And got excited about that and have been on a search for her. <laughs> for what it is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. that question rings in my head. Um, and I just think of the listeners too. There's probably there's always so much we don't yet understand mm-hmm. about who we are. And that that's life, right? Yeah. And that's the part of the excitement of life. And I love that you are excited, like that you're framing, because I think a lot of <laughs> yeah. people are scared by that. I know I'm more scared. What did I not know? Oh, and I assume yeah. it's going to be something scary. Oh, yeah. So I, I love that you're, I love. I think how it was framed with to me was like, this is in- so exciting so for you. Cool. And so yeah. I received it in that way. <laughs> it wasn't good. like, there's a lot you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I, I like that. And I think of, I do think of the listeners of where this lands for, for you of, um, what might, where might you be right now with your own identity? And, um, is it something that you are, do you find yourself on the one end, like in an identity crisis right now of not knowing who you are, whether that's, you're in a big transition or there's a a big loss in your life, um, of a role you're playing or whether you're kind of in a, in a place of, um, yeah, searching or interested. Um, and I just think there's a lot 
I, of course, I'm going to be more biased and as a therapist over bias of, <laughs> of, of wanting to understand myself better and understand people better. But I think there's a lot of richness in exploring um, oneself through the through, through that lens of like, what even would you answer in the question of who am I? If you were yeah. to list off all the I am, um, what would be on, in your identity pie chart? Yeah, I like those questions a lot. That last one reminds me of um, an episode we did a, a while back about forgiveness and the idea of, of kind of letting other parts of ourselves go and maybe even letting some expectations about who we're supposed to be go yeah. in order to find out something that's more authentic in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember back then, I, I think I might have quoted Cheryl Strayed, who said something about, like, don't surrender your happiness for an idea you used to have about yourself. Yeah, right. Um, mm -hmm. And I just think that that feels like a really relevant mm -hmm. idea within talking about identity. And we need to update, too. We need updates. We need to update totally. all the time. Yeah. I just yeah. think of the different life stages and... We need, we need updates. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. So next week or in two weeks, I guess, when our, our podcast, our next podcast is released, we are going to be talking to Riley Nichols. Kara, can you give us a little bit of information about what that conversation is going to be like in particular and how that, yeah. how that relates to identity? Yeah. So we're really excited to have Riley um, join us. He is the director of the Victory Program, which is uh, related to McCallum Place in St. Louis, Missouri. So it's a higher level of care treatment center treating athletes. Mm. Um, and it's actually um, the only place in the country that's devoted to treating athletes in higher level care facility. He is going to be talking specifically around sport identity, kind of just things to consider for an athlete in regards to identity. So we're excited to have him be a guest. Mm. That's going to be a really cool conversation, especially yeah. I feel like you've planned some things about your own experience as yes. an athlete. Right. And I think, yeah, I mean, I would just say for an athlete, there's so much in the culture of um, revering athletes and looking up to athletes and admiring athletes and kind of assuming a lot about how wonderful their life must be, especially professional athletes. And, you know, I think there's there's a lot that is not Full, like very developed <laughs> that can be like not as developed within an athlete. And, and I think um, identity is one of those categories. Mm. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to have more conversation to have more awareness around that mm. for, for the athletes that are listening and for, for those of you who have athletes in your life to be kind of more aware of that. Thank you so much for joining us. And thanks to Jack Straw Cultural Center for sound engineering, to Erin Davidson for the Appetites music, and to Sarah Taylor for production assistance and editing. Stay in touch with what's new on the Appetite by subscribing to the podcast on your preferred app. If you have the time, we'd so appreciate it if you'd leave a review for the Appetite, letting us know what you think and how you've enjoyed it. This can make it so much easier for others interested in non-diet approaches to food and body conversation to find our podcast in the future. If you have any questions or just want to connect, you can email us at theappetite at opalfoodandbody.com. We love to be in touch. If you're really interested in Opal specifically, please find out more information at www.opalfoodandbody.com. You can also follow Opal on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks again for listening. Talk to you next time.